मॉर्निंग वॉचिंग ऑल यू नीड टू नो ऑन ब्लूम बक्विंट आम दर्शन मेहता जो आनी द शो इज अगम वकील हुड स्पीक अबाउट दी एफ एन ओ क्यूज आल स्पीक अबाउट द जनरल ट्रेड सेटअप एंड डजेंट लुक गुड एट दिस पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम बिकॉज इफ यू लुकिंग एट द ग्लोबल मार्केट दैट मैनेज टू एंड विद पॉजिटिव बायस इवन यूरोप मैनेज टू एंड विद पॉजिटिव बायस बट कमिंग बैक टू एशिया द सीन डजेंट लुक वेरी वेरी गुड एट दिस पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम निकेज ऑफ द डेज हाई सिग्निफिकेंट अमाउंट ऑफ डाउन थिक दैट वो सीन ऑन द हैंग सेंग एंड द अदर एशियन मार्केट द एस डी फिफ्टी एच इज एन इंडिकेटर ऑफ हाउ वी विल ओपन कंटिन्यूज yesterday there was this big sell off that happened again a 27 point down tick is something that we can expect uh, in opening today now as far as you know the adrs are concerned uh, the banks took it on the chin so hdfc bank was down 3% icici bank was down 1.6% vedanta and tata motors were the one that were down in trade only dr reddies and infosys did manage to you know inch up slightly in trade now as far as crude is concerned after 3 days of immense selling crude finally managed to uh, pull it up it's up almost half a percent both on the w WTI side and Brent side, even the commodities on the LME managed to end with a positive buy. So, except for for lead, which was down, uh, which was uh, up, uh, which was down significantly. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, lead which was up two and a half percent. The other commodities also did well. The only thing that didn't do well was tin, which was down almost one percent. But nevertheless, commodities as a pack did well. Even in China, the start is rather decent. You're having copper, which is trading up. You're having aluminium, which is trading up, and uh, zinc is flat in trade. The only thing that's not doing well is steel. which is down 7 tenths of a percent and precious metals also having a muted day currently fund flows fis were buyers in the market yesterday almost uh, uh, 2354 crores of net buying that happened probably a lot have to do with the hdfc bank uh, fi window that opened fi di is sold in almost 712 crores in the cash market now overall if you looking at the nifty the nifty saw sell off of almost uh, 0.6 percent but it was immense on the mid cap and even worse on the small cap index which was down almost 3 percent in trade the two sectors that managed to fall the most was the real estate sector and the psu bank sector which fell in significantly in trade yesterday apart from it if you're looking at the wix the wix managed to move up all by almost 2.3% given the fact that volatility has increased uh, since the market has been rather choppy over the past few days uh, overall it was uh, hdfc bank that alone was responsible for half of the losses of the nifty uh, dragging the nifty down by 35 points india bulls housing and kotak uh, also down in trade what added a little bit of support was infosys and And reliance, but apart from it, uh, if HDFC Bank was the was the sole reason why the Nifty saw significant amount of selling pressure, and even the bank Nifty. But again, what are you seeing on the FNO side? Well, Darshan, uh, there has been some weakness on the Nifty, and uh, what we are witnessing is uh, some fresh shorts building up as far as the futures go, with a four and a half percent added in open interest. But coming to the Nifty Bank futures, that is where we are seeing longs unwind for the second straight day, with a decline of nearly four percent in open interest. The India Volatility Index, as one might expect. Has inched up further, still below the b- between the, um, the mark of 13 and 14. But the Nifty put call ratio, of course, also has come down to around 1.4. Now, in terms of changes in open interest, as you can see here, we're seeing more and more writing around the 10,700 call. So we are starting to see some resistance build around these levels, around 10,700, 10,800. We'll watch out for these levels. In terms of stocks, I'm watching out for Sun TV, which is one of the few gainers in yesterday's day of trade. We did see some. short covering coming along for sun tv but on the weaker end we there are plenty of other stocks such as pc jeweler which continues to grind lower it's lost another 17% in, and within well to a short side and we are also looking at more weakness in something like tvs motor company along with the rest of the auto pack which is seeing some shorts building in so as far as our own markets go now let's go across to paul allen for Uh, or rather let's let's go across to uh, raguram rajan because that he's just talking to us listening seems to be baked in uh, my guess is something unless something really untoward happens in the global economy or in the us economy which uh, in the us certainly there's no sign that something is is uh, bad is going to happen that we will have a couple more rate hikes after which the fed will look around and see well are we getting close so round 2.753 is approximately where it will stop maybe one more next year and and perhaps pause at that point and say we're closer to neutral than we were and maybe we have to see the consequences because monetary policy has lags but we've seen a route recently in emerging markets and your successor urjit patel has come out to say that you know the tapering pace of the fed uh, 
is to blame for what we've seen recently. Do you agree with that view? Well, I, I, I don't know that, uh, um, you know, uh, these, uh, the, the liquidity in the financial markets has disappeared as, as of now. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Patel is raising a question about going forward if there is a substantial withdrawal of liquidity, whether in fact it causes markets to tighten overly. But my, my guess at this point is the U.S. is focused on, uh, you know, the growth of the domestic economy and thinks that inflation is pretty much where it wants it to be. And with labor markets at below what it thinks is consistent with full employment, that is uh, um, at 3.7, this is a historic low, that uh, really they're focused inwardly. And unless there's something big outside that happens to knock them, uh, uh, knock their sense of what is going to happen in the U.S., they're going to continue. But having said that, should the Fed at least take cognizant of uh, the wrath that we saw in emerging markets? Well, Bear uh, that in mind. Uh, I think that, uh, a, you know, in a, in a world where uh, countries take full cognizance of the international responsibilities, uh, one of the things that I have been pressing for is really the sense that the big central banks should look at the consequences of their actions also on other countries. That said, I think emerging markets are in a much better situation today, with a few exceptions where, uh, you know, finances as well as politics are creating some uncertainty amongst international investors. But I think broadly they're in a much better situation than they were, say, around the time of the Tapo tantrum. That is not to say accidents cannot happen. Uh, that's agreeing with the view of Jerome Powell, who said that emerging markets are in a good position to navigate the shifts in U.S. policy. Uh, when you talk about there are exceptions, which countries? Well, are first, I, I would say they're in a better position. Uh, I think there will be still stress for the emerging markets, and they will have to cope with the rising dollar as well as rising international interest rates, as well as the flow back of capital flows, which always happens at times like this. So there will be stresses. Of course, if you look around the world and you ask which countries are already stressed, you would say Argentina is stressed. And of course, Turkey is undergoing some stress. The central bank has raised interest rates considerably, as well as simplified the interest rate structure. But I think in countries looking forward, uh, of course, Italy, uh, depending on what the government does and how much it wants to break the fiscal constraints that the uh, union puts on it uh, and the euro area puts, uh, that's going to be a, a place to watch. Brazil, where elections are coming up, and of course Brazil has a medium-term fiscal problem which it needs to resolve uh, by dealing uh, primarily with the pensions of public sector employees, that is going to face the next president. It's not going to happen before, but it's going to be something the next president will have to opine on very quickly. And that's something to watch out for. So there are countries that have issues uh, that they have to deal with as we go forward. You didn't mention any of the emerging markets in Asia. Well, I think Asian emerging markets are in a, in a healthier situation than in the past because of fairly narrow uh, current account deficits, um, fairly small fiscal deficits, as well as uh, moderate inflation. So there is more confidence in their currencies. Many of them have moved to inflation targeting regimes. And there is a sense that, you know, they're not going to let inflation get out of control. So they are in a different position. Uh, again, I would say that some of them can get stressed. At this point, I would say, uh, you know, uh, amongst the big ones, no clear and present danger. Uh, you talked about Italy and we saw the fallout from Italy throughout the world. Uh, two months ago, IMF chief Christine Lagarde did say that she was confident the Eurozone was on a sustainable path of growth. Does Italy change the prospects for Eurozone? Well, I think certainly the advent of a populist government in Italy uh, will raise the questions that have been raised and have been sort of have quietened down, which is what is the periphery getting? Now, in truth, the periphery has got a lot in terms of inheriting uh, a credible monetary policy, uh, much lower interest rates than they were used to. But at this point, in a relative sense, when they look uh, at the past, 
they feel that the exchange rate is stronger than they would like. And the benefits of low interest rates are being subverted to some extent by fears about the, uh, these countries uh, and uh, the spreads are widening. So on the one hand, we don't have as flexible an exchange rate as we would want. On the other hand, interest rates are higher for us than we would like uh, relative to what they were in the past. And so our firms are paying these higher interest rates, are not being able to match uh, competition from, say, Germany or the Netherlands. And so the core periphery sort of divide is growing again. Now, I mean, there is a dialogue to be had, but it is going to be a tough one. Italy is one challenge. The other challenge is trade, U.S. and NAFTA, U.S. and China, yeah. and of course, U.S. and its U.S. Uh, steel and aluminum yeah. uh, tariffs. Uh, is Asia most at risk yeah. when it comes to concern of a protectionism? Well, unfortunately, accidents can happen. And this, the world is not well prepared for the entity at the center of the global financial and, uh, and monetary order and trade order uh, turning around and saying, I don't believe in all this. I want to change things. Now, the system has been built by the U.S. around the U.S. And now the U.S. actually doesn't believe in using the multilateral system. This is a very big change. And we're not prepared for it. Now, you would hope that good sense prevails that some of what we see see our bargaining tactics uh, rather than uh, actual threats which should be carried out. The problem, of course, is positions harden. You make a threat, somebody else makes a counter threat, soon you find you cannot back off. And then we get into, uh, this is true of war, it's true of trade war. And one of the big worries is that threats are being made left, right, and center by uh, sort of strong, uh, I would say largely men, uh, strong men who want to be seen as strong. And the room to back off is far more limited. And every country, whether democratic or authoritarian, uh, essentially the governments want to look strong. So my worry is what uh, you may think of as bargaining ploys, uh, working out the art of the deal, uh, soon becomes hardened positions which become very difficult to back off. Uh, and then you enter actual conflagration. And that combined with the high degree of leverage and asset prices which are you know, priced to perfection, uh, that's a potent volatile combination. Uh, Dr. Rajan, we have to leave that for the moment. We'll be back with Dr. Raghuram Rajan just very shortly. We'll come to you live from the uh, Namu. The White House has announced the first details of President Trump's historic summit with Kim Jong-un next week. The two will meet at 9 a.m. Singapore time on June the 12th, although it's still not clear exactly where. The agenda is also unclear. Both sides want denuclearization, but that means different things. The U.S. wants North Korea to abandon nuclear weapons, while the North wants American forces to leave the peninsula. Senate Majority Whip John Cornyn says the NAFTA talks have missed a key deadline and Congress probably won't have time to approve a new deal this year. House Speaker Paul Ryan said early last month that legislators would need notice of a deal by May 17th if they were to vote before the current Congress ends. Ryan later said there might be a couple of weeks of wiggle room, placing the deadline around early June. Reports from Washington say former White House economic aide Gary Cohn withheld the monthly payroll numbers from President Trump. Politico says he held on to the information out of concern that the president might comment on them. Trump moved markets last week by tweeting in advance of the May numbers that he was looking forward to them. That indicated they would be favorable. Apple is making its strongest statement yet on privacy and the inclination of companies such as Facebook to track users. Software engineering head Craig Federighi said Apple will make it dramatically more difficult for big data to monitor individuals. The news came as Apple announced a range of new software, including features to help mobile users wean themselves off their screen addiction. Global news 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Paul Allen. This is Bloomberg. 
Okay, the stock of the day has to be Biocon. Uh, overnight, what has happened is that the US FDA has approved uh, Pecfilgrastim for Biocon. So it's a drug that is developed by Biocon as well as Myelin. It's the first biosimilar uh, to Nulesta. So that's extremely positive. They've, and this comes out of the Bangalore facility, uh, which also which is ex extremely positive. Now, basically, this is uh, you know basically used uh, to reduce the risk of uh, cancer. Uh, that's what the drug does. Uh, uh, Fulfilla is a drug that uh, Myelin and Biocon have have named uh, it's the second approval after uh, you know uh, after trastuzumab which they had got the approval earlier and uh, and you know myelin has said that they anticipate the launch that will come in in the next few weeks how is this important it's a big drug uh, 4.2 billion dollars is the sales that the company had uh, so that's extremely positive so it's a large chunk that is there obviously the ramp up will be very very gradual the price erosion also won't be very very high but nevertheless they will have sizable amount of market share uh, going into the drug because they are the first compass similar to launch in this drug. The second positive because of this is the fact that this allays any concern uh, on the Bangalore plant because remember the US FDA had issued a form 483 with seven observations to the Bangalore plant and that actually if this comes out of the uh, Bangalore stable and the US FDA has approved it that means it's positive for Biocon so expect the stock to react positively in trade today. Let's also get your check on the commodity space starting off with oil uh, which is currently trading positive to the tune of about half a percent but remember that WTI did see a 1.6 percent fall overnight. Now there is there, there is more evidence of uh, OPEC relaxation uh, by the fact that uh, OPEC has actually pumped in about uh, 32 million barrels uh, for uh, a day uh, for the last month which is uh, you know unchanged from the month of uh, April as per, as per a Bloomberg survey. Also uh, US uh, crude oil inventory is likely to drop as much as 3 million barrels. This is also once again as per a Bloomberg survey. So wait and watch uh, how the inventory data actually pans out. As far as uh, base metals are concerned, the index itself uh, climbed for the fifth consecutive day on London Metal Exchange. Aluminium and copper climbed for the third straight day while we had uh, nickel, zinc and lead which also rose on the LME. Uh, tin was the only metal which declined in trade and it in fact uh, snapped its uh, four day winning streak. Uh, there is uh, plenty of uh, moves coming in from the agri space so watch out for ice, uh, sugar and cocoa, both of which declined more than 4% overnight. Now if you look at uh, the precious metal space, uh, gold has been under some pressure and is currently trading below the 1300 mark and it's uh, you know on course for a fourth straight day of decline. Well, a bunch of news that we're tracking this morning would be first up, uh, Suntech Reality, where uh, the stock has been under pressure past four to five sessions today, might see an uptick given that the investment limit has been for FBI has been hiked to 49% from 24% earlier. The same is the case with Idea Cellular, where DOT has approved to increase the FDI limit to 100% from 67.5% presently. Also, we have a couple of buybacks where the Wiseman Forex is expected to buy back around 4.4 lakh shares or around 3.77% of its equity at a price of around 700 per two sh uh, 702 share which means uh, a 25% premium as compared to the current market price for a sum of around 31 odd crore. Also we have Jagran Prakashan which is actually going to be buying back 1.5 crore of its share representing 4.82% of its equity at a price of 195 per share which means 18% uh, uptick from the current market price. Uh, in terms of pharma, uh, we have Biocon and apart from that we have Lupin which has received an US FDA note for two fits cream used for infections. Also we have uh, in other developments we have MCX uh, where uh, the company is expected to have signed a deal to acquire 24% in CDSL commodity uh, repository. We might just see some reaction on back of that. So Darshan Chemicals, a small cap company, 3000 North crores, the market capitalization is divesting its plan. Plastic master batch business division is also expected to invest around 1,000 odd crore uh, over a span of next five years. Also, we are tracking Maruti Suzuki, where the total production of the company for the month of May has registered a 22% growth out there. Westbridge Crossover Fund LC, which has next invested a sum of around 65 crore in Kajaria Ceramics to MyGCN Reaction. 
So the RBI has finally gotten its fourth deputy governor. On Monday, uh, MK Jain, the current MD and CEO of IDBI Bank, was appointed as the fourth deputy governor at the Reserve Bank of India for a period of three years. Uh, now, prior to this appointment, uh, Jain uh, was appointed as the MD and CEO of IDBI Bank on the, uh, in April 2017. Uh, prior to that, he was the MD and CEO of Indian Bank, where he had actually uh, managed to turn around Indian Bank. Uh, following his performance at Indian Bank, he was actually uh, appointed at IDBI and he was overseeing IDBI's turnaround by ensuring a focus on uh, not only debt uh, stress test resolution uh, but also on the sale of non-core assets. Now let look at, let's take a look at uh, uh, what MK Jain's resume looks like. He has over 30 years of experience uh, within the banking sector. He also serves on the board of three important institutions. There's Exim Bank, uh, there's uh, the National Institute of Banking Management and IBPS which is the Banking Personnel School. Um, apart from this, uh, uh, Jain also has uh, an MBA, an FRM, and a PGA, PG in commerce, which were all important uh, qualifications uh, for the uh, for this position, according to what the Reserve Bank of India had said earlier this year when they were looking out for candidates. Now, according to that statement of the Reserve Bank of India, this the candidate who would be selected as a fourth uh, RBI deputy governor would be looking at uh, banking supervision and compliance, would also look at large corporate debt and the corporate uh, bond market, uh, but will also look at stressed assets management uh, because that is a new uh, category that was included uh, within the RBI deputy governor's uh, duties uh, by the Reserve Bank of India when they were looking for this position. Uh, now after uh, MK Jain will be appointed uh, at the RB RBI, there will be three banks. IDBI will uh, join this list of three banks uh, where there is no MD and CEO currently. Allahabad Bank, uh, in that case uh, we saw Roshanath Subramanian uh, being uh, taken out of that post uh, because there were some CBI investigations pending against her uh, in the Nirav Modi case, uh, Dena Bank uh, lost its MD and CEO due to retirement uh, and now IDBI Bank joins this list where there is no leader and it is important IDBI Bank's case because if you remember in the March quarter results, IDBI uh, Bank reported nearly 28% gross NPA and currently the bank is in the midst of a turnaround strategy as I mentioned earlier uh, but th that is not fully complete. In the absence of a leader, it remains to be seen how exactly this turnaround will be completed in time. Let's also look at the top three stocks that you need to keep on your radar. Based on the delivery data as of yesterday, uh, the first stock that's on the list is Sun TV, which was up about 4% uh, in trade and saw delivery buying of just over 100 crores. The delivery volume, in fact, surged more than 150% as compared to its five-day average and the total volume also more than doubled as compared to its five-day average. Second stock to watch out for, that would be PC Jeweller. Now, that was down about 17% uh, in trade and saw delivery selling of nearly 100 crores. The delivery volume volume actually uh, uh, you know, uh, surged about 82% as compared to its 5-day average and the total volume more than doubled as compared to its 5-day average. Last and final stock uh, from the Nifty Nex, uh, Bajaj Finserve. Now, that was down about 2-2.5% in trade and saw delivery selling of 110 crores. But the delivery volume that surged about 80% as compared to its total volume jump of just about 29% as compared to its 5-day average. All right, there's lots to talk about over the course of the day. You'll find all the live market action right here on Bloomberg Quint Live and also several stories on the website that are currently available among them. Idea Cellular has said that the telecom department has approved raising the foreign direct investment limit in the company to 100%, putting its merger deal with Vodafone in the last leg of regulatory clearance. And there's an update in uh, the insolvency process in a move that will bring relief and clarity to acquirers of insolvent companies. SEBI has said that these companies can be delisted without following the prescribed methods under its current delisting regulations. That's all you need to know going into trade today. Lots to talk about over the course of the day, starting with Indian Open that starts in just a few minutes. Do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quinton.